Hold on just a minute while we check our systems. Okay, webinar recording is good. Welcome again, everyone. I'm your host and moderator for today's webinar. Our title is Evaluation, All the Funded ATE Proposals Are Doing It. I'd like to acknowledge our host for this year's webinar season. Our new host is ATE Central. Their model is supporting advanced technological education, and you can see their link right there. ATE, ATE Central is a free online por portal and collection of materials and services dedicated to highlighting, highlighting the work of the NSF ATE program. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the Evaluation Support Center for the National Science Foundation's ATE, that means Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate serves the ATE community and others by holding webinars like this one on evaluation and maintaining an open access resource library, a curated blog about STEM evaluation, and collecting and disseminating data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out that Evaluate website. You can see it at the bottom of the screen there, evaluate-evalu-8.org. The slides from this webinar are already on Evalu Evaluate's website, along with the ATE evaluation planning checklist and several other resources to help you develop your ATE proposals evaluation plan. Go ahead anytime during this webinar and access them from that middle window on the right-hand side of your screen. A new, a new browser window will open then. Let me make some introductions. I'm Mike Lasecki there on the left. I'm with Luca Partners and I'm be the moderator and the, for the webinar today. I also serve on Evaluate's Community College Liaison Panel. Lori Wingate, who is the main presenter today, is the director of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. And behind the scenes, we have Emma Perk at the Evaluation Center Sharon Gusky at, at uh, Connecticut in the Connecticut, excuse me, Connecticut Community College. Janet Pinhorn and Shannon Payne work with us in the background, making sure that this webinar works perfectly. This material, it's a good time to point out today that the views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters and do not necessarily affect those of our sponsor, the National Science Foundation. And now I'll turn things over to Lori. Go ahead, Lori. Thank you, Mike. And I saw some chat on the side among our organizers that the audio may not have been working for our participants. So could our participant please type in the chat and let us know if you could hear or not. I see Chris Felty's note that there was no audio. Before I go, because we can just restart if, if folks didn't get the intro. OK. okay everyone can hear. Uh, it looks fun. So Looks like we're good, Lori. Thank you. Great. So I just wanted to be sure about that. So um, thanks for that great introduction, Mike. And I just want to say hello to everybody and welcome for joining us today. I'm really excited about talking to you about preparing your evaluation plans for your ATE proposal. So this webinar is going to be presented in three sections. And there'll be question breaks in between. So I just want to make sure that everyone does see the chat box to the right of the slide. Um, so you know where you can put your questions and comments at any time during the webinar. And then Mike will share those with me at the question breaks. And I'll do my best to answer your questions. And I may throw some of those questions at Mike because he is a very experienced ATE PI as well as an evaluator. So this webinar is for individuals who are planning or thinking about submitting proposals to the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. And the ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. The program funds projects, centers, targeted research, and some conferences and workshops. And as you can see here, they are interested in funding several different types of projects. Centers include resource and national centers, and as well as planning grants for national centers. Three levels of research are funded, including planning and pilot studies, exploratory research and development projects, 
and full-scale research and development. The program also supports a few workshops and conferences, and those proposals can be submitted at any time of the year. All other proposals are due um, October 5th. So I've grayed out targeted research and workshops and conferences because um, while all these types of awards do require an evaluation component, this webinar is focused on the evaluation of projects and centers. Targeted research and, and conferences also have to be assessed, but the expectations of those are quite different, and we aren't going to be addressing those um, unless you have questions. I'm happy to answer questions about that at the break. So what does NSF mean by evaluation? So the basic dictionary definition of evaluation is that it is the um, determination of something's quality, value, or importance. And when we're talking about NSF project evaluation, we're really talking about doing this systematically and with the support of good evidence. So why does NSF require ATE projects to be evaluated? Well, evaluation serves three main purposes in this context. At the most basic level, a systematic evaluation supports a high degree of accountability. So individual grantees are held accountable for their use of federal resources, and the information helps NSF to be accountable to Congress and justify continued support of the program. It also supplies evidence about a project's outcomes and impacts, and it helps the people involved in running this program and to, to, to figure out the extent to which the investment, the federal investment, is worthwhile. So evaluation to determine the overall quality and effectiveness of a project is what we call summative evaluation, a term you may have heard. But I think the most important role of evaluation is for project improvement. So evaluation results often show ways that a project can be improved to enhance results. And it can also help projects determine which aspects of what they're doing are more or less successful, so those precious resources can be used to more efficiently to maximize outcomes. So evaluation to inform improvement is what we call formative evaluation. Now NSF did issue a new solicitation for the ATE program this year, and there are changes to the evaluation requirements. It's not so much that, and I know many of you here are interested in what those changes are, and it's not so much that they're so different from the prior solicitation and the, the guidance that was in the prior version, but I would say that the guidance is more specific and clear and it's, it, it's more consolidated. You can look to, to one spot and get most of the information you need in the, in the program solicitation. I do want to call your attention to this statement which says that all ATE funded work must be evaluated right here. Um, and late in the webinar, we're going to be discussing exactly what goes in this required evaluation section. Like for all programs in NSF, uh, proposals to the ATE program are reviewed by a panel of your peers. And they'll be judging how well your proposal meets the NSF review criteria of intellectual merit and broader impacts. So if we boil these concepts down, Basically, intellectual merit is about the project's potential to advance knowledge, and broader impacts is about the potential to benefit society. So each of these criteria includes several sub-criteria, and I just want to urge you, don't even start working on a proposal until you know these criteria and that you've read the entire ATE program solicitation. And when you do that, you'll find the ATE program has some additional review criteria, including some that pertain specifically to evaluation, and I'll share those with you later. So I am going to throw a lot of information at you in this 60-minute webinar, so I, but I don't want you to worry about trying to remember it all. We have several resources, as Mike has mentioned, to help you apply what, you've what you're going to learn today, and then you can use those when you start working on your proposals. And I've listed them all here, and they're color-coded for the three sections of the webinar. And I'll refer to these at relevant points in the webinar. And there are links to all of these materials on the web page about this webinar. And, they, and Mike has mentioned there's a clickable link just to the right of the slide on your screen. All right. So if you don't look at anything else in that list of resources, I suggest you look at the evaluation planning checklist for ATE proposals 
that we've created to support you in this process. It's six pages long. It includes links to even more resource materials in, around specific topics. And it's organized by proposal components. So you can be sure you'll be getting all the information about your evaluation that you need into the right places in your proposal package. And speaking of that, this is a list of the required components of an NSF proposal. And this is according to the NSF Grant Proposal Guide. And these check marks identify the components where there needs to be information related to your evaluation. We're going to be discussing how to incorporate evaluation elements into each of these sections to strengthen your proposal and increase your chances for a favorable review. Now, when you work on your proposal, you're going to work on these sections in the order that makes sense for your team, and almost certainly you're going to do it in an iterative fashion. But we're just going to work straight down the list in the order that you see them listed here, starting with the cover sheet. So this document is automatically generated as you provide answers to questions in the Fastlane system, which is where you, uh, one of the systems you use to submit your ATE proposal. So how does evaluation figure into the cover sheet? Well, it shows up here in the form of a little box that you'll need to check if you'll be collecting information from or about human subjects. We also can call these people as part of your project's evaluation or research efforts, or really for any reason. But if it's not practical to obtain approval from a human subjects institutional review board prior to submitting your proposal, which is typically the case, you should indicate pending in this box. But do note that you will need approval before your grant is awarded. So next in the list is a project summary. It's second on the list, but in all likelihood, it will probably be one of the first, I mean, sorry, the last pieces that you that you work on because it's a summary of what you're going to do. So this is, document is used by NSF program officers to determine how to group the proposals they receive and assign them to reviewers. So you want to start off with a really strong and a really clear statement about what, what your project is about and, and who it's going to serve. Now the project summary is just a synopsis. It's about a page and a half um, about your project. And here is where you'll provide an overview of your project's activities and the main audiences, and statements about its intellectual merit and broader impacts, which are those main NSF review criteria. Now, if you have a strong evaluation component that strengthens your project's intellectual merit and broader impact, I suggest that you highlight some aspects of that, the evaluation pieces here. And keeping that in mind, just check out, make sure you review those ATE-specific uh, criteria that pertain to evaluation. You might want to highlight aspects of your evaluation in your project summary. Next is your project description. So this is that 15-page explanation of what you're going to do with the grant funds. And this is the bulk of your proposal package. And you have to cover a lot of ground here. And the things I've listed here are the key elements of your project description. And I've pulled these right out of the ATE program solicitation. So the two places where evaluation needs to figure prominently are the results from prior NSF support and, of course, the evaluation plan. So let's think about results of prior support first. So basically, if the, the guideline is if the PI or the co-PI on the proposal has received funding from NSF related to the current proposal, if they've gotten funding for that in the past five years, the project description has to begin with a section that's titled results from prior support, prior NSF support. So if that applies to you, this is where you describe your previous project's outcome. So reviewers are going to be looking for evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work that's related to the current proposal. Now, if you have a related project that's funded by another organization other than NSF, they do want to hear that about, about that as well. And if you haven't had a prior related award, award, you can just omit this section. And this can be up to five pages. So this information has to be reported under these headings of intellectual merit and broader impact. So this is where you would put evaluation results from past projects to show how your project helped advance knowledge and had a benefit to society. And you want to give priority to reporting higher level impacts for example, if you have student outcome data, that's going to be more compelling 
than you know statistics related to website visits or satisfaction ratings and things like that. So next I have an exercise where you're going to play the role of a proposal reviewer in considering evidence about the outcomes of prior NSF support. So here's a statement that could show up in a results of prior support section. So it's, and just, you can read it, I'm sure you've already read it. So what I'd like you to do is, the poll question is gonna come up right there on the screen. So answer it to indicate if you think that this information would be compelling to reviewers as evidence of intellectual merit or broader impact of previously funded work. Okay, everybody's honing in right on no. Right, so I think we would all agree that it's important to for a project to reach its goals. Um, but just saying that goals were met is not very compelling, particularly if those goals were focused on what the project was going to do, so activity-focused goals, rather than on what difference it was going to make. So providing evidence of the changes brought about by a project is what's really important. Okay. Thank you, Mike. So we'll go on to, I have two more of these. So this one states, the project developed three lab manuals, provided 40 faculty with professional development, and served 125 students. So same thing, answer the poll. Okay, so a little more than half agreeing this is good evidence. Of some people are a little more skeptical. Skeptical. So you may have been seduced by those numbers, right? So a lot of there's some data in there. So I would say, from my perspective, this is evidence of productivity, which is great. But from this statement, we don't know what changes in teaching and learning, employment, or anything else occurred because of these activities. So it's okay to include information like this. I mean, you do need to describe what your project did. But this doesn't quite go for, far enough in terms of reporting on outcomes, like what, what changes came about because of these activities. So reviewers will want to know what the results of these activities were. OK, Mike, you can clear that. And we'll go on to the last example. The project supported internships for 75 students, more than half of whom secured full-time positions at their internship sites. So let me know what you think of this one. Oh, you guys are excited about this one. Excellent. Yes, I think this is a very nice example that not only touches on what the project did and how many students it served, but also what changed for those students because of their engagement with the project, or more on the level of outcome evidence that we would want to see. All right, cool. Thanks for doing that. So we can clear, yeah. OK, we have, um, to help you with this, if, if this applies to your proposal, we have a one-page checklist to help you prepare your results from prior support sections. It includes NSF's requirements as well as our evaluates, that is, suggestions for this part of your project description. Again, you can access this and all the other resources that I'm going to highlight in this webinar from the link on the right side of your screen. I would say that even if you don't have results from a prior project to, to report in the proposal that you're submitting this fall, I do encourage you to just go ahead and review this checklist because it will help you to start thinking about how to set up your evaluation of, of your new project to produce the kind of results that would be compelling in this section um, when you go back for more funding. And again, results of prior support is up to five pages, so it's, it can be a very important part of your proposal. So here's that list of uh, project description components again. And we just discussed the results from prior support. And we're going to have a question break now. And after that, we're going to get into probably what you really hear uh, to hear about is the, the evaluation plan. So, Mike, do we have any questions? We have a bunch of questions today, Lori, and they're really sort of focused on that five-page section, results of prior support. So one question is, um, should you include 
for example, the changes and the lessons learned there, or should you just focus on the results? I mean, how much should you get into that? That could affect what the current proposal is doing. Um, from what my understanding is that reviewers and NSF program officers really like to see uh, people to use that section to show how they're building on their prior uh, support that they've gotten. So not, on, not only what the evidence of, of their outcomes are, but what, le like you said, what lessons did they learn? How are they going to leverage those lessons? What are they going to do differently? Um, and so I think it's not just about you know, putting on a glossy you know, show about how great you were, but also what did you learn along the way and how you're going to build on those lessons. So you basically need to describe, you know, I like to include basically what the project was, but you do have to organize it in your evidence in terms of those areas of intellectual merit and broader impact. Sure, that makes sense. And, and several people have said, you know, if you, if you don't have any prior support, well, number one, can you use something from related? And then number two, if you don't have it, you get five free pages for your proposal development, don't you? Yeah, so um, again, I, if you had a prior project that was related to what you're submitting and it wasn't funded by NSF, they do want to hear about that. And like you said, if, if you're on the other end where you had nothing, you know, you can just say no results to no prior support to discuss and move on and you get that five pages uh, to talk about what you want to do. I will add a small, you know, there's a little, a little situation for special to centers renewing. So if you're a national center and you are renewing, you have the option of including your results of prior support as a supplementary document. As a five, you can add that five pages up. You can upload with your supplementary documents. That only applies to renewing centers, and they can just if that they can just include a sentence in their main part of their proposal saying it's in a supplementary document. All right, I think we'll we'll pause here for our questions. We'll just mention one quick one to a response to a chat. It is 15 pages total. Five of those 15 are. Uh, up to those five are for the results of prior support. But nonetheless, the narrative still gets limited to 15. I thought I would just mention that. Lori, why don't you go ahead and take us into the next section. We'll have another question break at the end of that one. OK, wonderful. And I think you probably are going to have lots of questions. This is going to be the meatiest part of the webinar. Um, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of what should go into the evaluation section of your project description. First, I want to touch just a little bit on logic models. So I personally am a big fan of logic models and evaluate. We're often singing the praises of logic models. And I just threw up a few thumbnail images here to show you, you know, the variety of what they can look like. These are from um, various ATE and other STEM education projects. So they come in lots of different formats, but typically they'll show a project's main inputs or resources and activities, outputs, and outcomes. So it's these are a great way to show the purpose and the structure of a project succinctly, and they're really helpful for evaluation planning. Now, with regard to including a logic model in your proposal, you should be aware they are not required for ATE proposals. They're allowed. They're just not required. And if you do include one in your project description, make sure it just fits on a page. Please note that it cannot be submitted as a supplemental document. Um, or it should not be submitted because there's only certain types of materials that are okay to include as supplemental documents with ATE proposals. Now, we're not going to get into how to do create a logic model, but if you want uh, to do one for your project, you can check out our logic model template, which includes question prompts and examples that are tailored to the ATE program. And if you want to learn more about how to integrate a logic model into a funding proposal, you can check out the recording, slides, and handout from the webinar that we did on that topic about a year ago. And if you want to see example, those examples I showed, those thumbnail examples, you want to see larger versions, those are in that slide deck. All right, let's get back to our proposal package. Here's that description of what goes in the project description. and just want to reorient you that we're talking now about the evaluation plan specifically. So your project description can be up to 15 pages long maximum, including those results from prior support. And you should dedicate about one to three pages of this to the evaluation section. I would say aim for about a page and a half, unless you have a good reason for it to be shorter or longer than that. So in these few pages, 
you need to identify who is going to evaluate your project and briefly describe their qualifications. Then you need to identify the focus of the evaluation with evaluation questions or objectives. And you'll need to describe how you will collect data to address those questions. This conference appears to be inactive and will be ended soon. If you are the host and wish this conference to continue, please press any key on your telephone touchpad. So I just heard a recording and I'm going to assume on the conference line, I'm going to assume that our wonderful technical hosts are dealing with that. I'm, I'm sorry um, about that, uh, Lori. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> sorry. We are live, right? Okay. No, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as long as everyone can continue to hear. Um, right. So next is data inter analysis and interpretation. So how are you going to make sense of the data that you collect? And NSF, it isn't, they, this isn't just a scientific exercise. They want your evaluation to be useful to you and to other people. So you should mention what the evaluation will produce and how the project's going to use that information. Now, and finally, either in the evaluation section or elsewhere in the proposal, you should convey the timeline for the evaluation. Now, when we talked about uh, the changes to the ATE program solicitation, so this is basically the list in, in the solicitation, they say the evaluation should include these things. So this is, isn't just my crazy idea, um, but it's very specific in, in the program solicitation. This is what they want to see now. So regarding that first point about identifying your evaluator, the ATE program states that the funds to support an evaluator independent of the project or center must be requested. So a common question that proposers ask is, well, how do I find an evaluator? We are not going to be getting into that in depth in this webinar. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer those at the question break. But to help you with this task, we've created a guide to finding and selecting an evaluator for ATE proposals. So it walks you through the process of finding an evaluator, picking the right person to work with you, and it goes through nine common questions about this topic. And we include guidance about what to do if you aren't able to work with your evaluator in advance of an award being made because of a policy that's in place at your institution. Again, I, there's usually a lot of questions about this, and so I'm happy to answer those at the break. But I put pretty much everything I know right here in these three three page guide. So after you identify who's going to do the work, you should clarify the focus of the evaluation by presenting a set of evaluation questions or objectives. So evaluation questions are just questions about the project's quality, impact, effectiveness, um, that the evaluation is going to answer based on evidence. So these are parallel to research questions in a research project. And I'll share some examples. So we're going to use a case that's a project from a proposal that NSF uses for its mock reviews when it's helping people figure out how to write a good proposal. So this case is, uh, this project is for developing wind energy, uh, a wind energy technician program. And the project goals are to expand and improve the curriculum, develop career pathways, and enhance recruitment, retention, and replacement efforts. So here's a set of evaluation questions. Um, and before I talk about them, I just want to give you like half a minute to read through them on your own to get, so you can get a sense of what they're about. So I'll just be quiet, and you can just read these. All right, hopefully you got a chance to read most of those. So I want to point out that they address both the project's processes and outcomes. And also, you know, if you think about them, they will probably require more than one data point to answer. Each one of them will require more than one single piece of data to answer. And they're phrased purposefully to allow for a continuum of conclusion, not just a yes or a no. And they can be answered with a single number. So these are overarching questions about the project 
and they align with both the activities and the goals, which is very important for any proposal evaluation plan, that it's closely aligned with what the project is going to do. Now, if you want to learn more about what makes a good evaluation question, because we don't have time to go into it in depth here, I suggest you look at the checklist on evaluation questions that I developed with my colleague, Daniela Schroeder. And if you want to see an, a slower and more in-depth demonstration of developing evaluation questions based on a project description and logic model, you can check out the recording and the related materials from the webinar we did on small-scale evaluation earlier this year, where we really break this process down. So moving on to the next part of your evaluation section is data collection. So basically what information you need in order to address your evaluation questions and how you will get that information. So for each evaluation question, you need to lay out a clear-cut plan for how you'll answer uh, that question. So for each one, you want to specify what will be measured. So these are your indicators. Uh, for example, if you're surveying students, are you going to be measuring their satisfaction with the program, uh, looking for self-assessments of their competence, asking about their um, intentions regarding employment? So lots of times I'll see descriptions of methods without any information about what it is it's actually going to be measured. So you really want to be clear about this. And once you've defined what will be measured, then explain how that information will be obtained and using what means. So this is where you'll get into the specific data collection method. So, you know, surveys, observations, focus groups, interviews, those are the, you know, typical common ones. And you want to look for opportunities to measure the same thing in multiple ways so you can really build a body of evidence. And you should be specific about where the data will come from. So let's say you're going to do a survey. Well, who are who will be surveyed? Will it be the students, the faculty, everyone who participated, or just a sample of them? So we want to be clear about the sources of information uh, that you where you're getting your information. Include timing in your data collection plan to show that the information will be obtained and reported in a timely way that makes sense with the project schedule. All right, next I'm going to put you back in the role of a reviewer. So take a moment to read this excerpt, it's just a couple sentences from an evaluation plan and then we'll go through some questions about it. Okay, so just remember, we're looking for what data will be collected, how, from who, or what sources, and when. So this is just two sentences, but it's pretty dense. So let's see if we can answer these questions. And now I'm going to ask you to use the chat box. So what, in this little example, what is it that's going to be measured? So not the method, but what, what are the indicators? What are they going to measure? So use the chat box to say what you think. Okay, here we go. So Max says student intent. Linda also echoed that intent to pursue certain degrees. Judy's also, a lot of people are honing in on that intent to pursue the degrees. Yep. Okay, Amanda's adding in factors that influence students' education choices. Yep. Exactly. So it's pretty clear. We can, you can see it. Um, if we really pick this apart, it's clear that what will be measured are that intent to pursue those degrees and the factor that influence their education choices. So saying you're going to do a survey doesn't tell us what will be measured. Here it says what will be measured. Good. Let's move on to how. How will those data be collected? All right, Pamela, Deb, Vicki, Kristen, Amanda, John are all seeing surveys, and then we're now we're also seeing some focus groups. People are in, look further down, yeah. This pops out pretty clearly as well, mainly through a, focus, a survey and focus group. Let's move on to who. We could also say what are the 
resources, but I wanted to use a different word there. So who will provide the information for the evaluation? So where, what is the source of the information? Well, Diana, John, Max, Judy, everyone, the, those dual enrolled students. And in case you're not familiar with that, when dual enrolled, we're talking about students who are enrolled at the high school and the um, uh, college level at the same time. Good. Let's see, I can highlight that. So both methods um, are using, are, are obtaining data from those dual enrolled students. So finally, when will the data be collected? Can you tell from this example? Yep, so there's two t time points, and you guys are honing in right in on those. End of the survey will be at the end of each semester, and the focus group will be at the end of each spring semester. So we're getting the timing and the frequency. Okay, so this example is pretty specific and concrete. It's just a little snippet. Now here's a different example. So we're not going to go through, the, through this one piecemeal, but just take a moment to scan it. And then use the chat box to answer any of those questions. What data will be collected, how, from whom, and when. Go ahead and tell me all the details of this plan. Getting some question marks from Linda. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I, this is an actual proposal that uh, I had the, had, have access to. It was not an ATE proposal, but this is, I did not make this up just for illustrative purposes. This really does happen. So you see all these buzzwords, right? Mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative data, formative and summative, merit and worth, best practices, all this stuff. But it actually provides none of the key information that we need to know about data collection, none of the nuts and bolts basically just a very generic and cookie cutter description. So this is not what you want to see for your project, okay? You really do want to be specific in your data collection plan to show you have a clear vision for the evaluation. So moving on, next, and then we need to touch on data analysis and interpretation. I don't think you need to get super detailed in your short evaluation section about analysis and interpretation, and which is why I've put this together. But you do need to show that you have a plan for what you're going to do with the information once you have it. So analysis is that process of transforming raw data into usable information. So this might include identifying themes out of qualitative data or producing descriptive statistics or more advanced statistics. Interpretation is what we do so we can actually answer the evaluation question. So the little guy in this picture, he's measured the height of the water, he's measured it in inches, so we have the measurement, but now he needs to interpret this finding to determine if that glass is half empty or half full. So interpretation is the process we use to answer, to reach conclusions with regard to those evaluation questions. Now, an efficient way to present these elements of an evaluation plan is to put them in a table like this. So do not worry about reading this content here. That's not the point of this. I just want to show you the format. So as you can see now, each of the pieces we covered is in a separate column in the table, and it's keyed to the evaluation question. So the good thing about this format, whether you include it in your proposal or not, is that it forces you to be specific about why you're collecting the pieces of data that you're planning to collect. And and how you're going to get the information. Now, if you want to put your data collection plan in a table like that, we've got guidance for you in our data collection planning matrix template, which includes definitions and examples uh, for each component. Moving on in the evaluation plan, you should describe the evaluation deliverables and how you'll use that information. At least you need to describe what types of reports will be developed, and when and how the results will be shared. And finally, you should include information about the timeline for the evaluation. This can go in the evaluation section or it can be integrated with the overall timeline for your project. You just need to show that the evaluation is an integral part of your project and not something that you're treating as a separate activity or waiting till the very end to deal with.
Now the ATE program, as I mentioned, has several additional review criteria um, in addition to the general ones that apply to the NSF program. And three of them, as I mentioned, are about evaluation. So you want to make sure that your evaluation really is well aligned with your project outcomes and that it's going to produce and share useful information and that those results will be disseminated. To help you see how this all goes together in an evaluation plan in your proposal, we've created a, a proposal evaluation plan template, uh, which isn't just a fill in the blank kind of thing. It, it's just guidance on to help you understand how to organize all these pieces and present it, present the information in, in the small space that you have. So if you were thinking that you were finished with evaluation once you got your evaluation section written, you're mistaken. So there's a few more places in your proposal package where evaluation should show up, and we're going to discuss those after a question break. So we should have plenty of time for all your questions now. About Thank you, Lori. Go ahead, Mike. You know, we do have um, uh, several questions, and you mentioned it. You alluded it to it in addressing the review criteria. Here's the first question. At the NSF, do they assign point values to the score? Uh, how, do, how does I mean, does a reviewer say this is good or very good, or how do they judge? How does a reviewer judge the evaluation section? Um, so there aren't points in NSF, NSF reviews. It's been a while since I've been on a review panel, but there were no, there are no, there's not a point system. So the, the reviewers are really looking at it holistically and, and coming up with conclusions about how good the proposal is in relation to those review criteria. So they're looking at the specific criteria and then looking throughout a project to see how well the proposal is addressing each of those. And Mike, I would welcome your comments on that question as well, because I know you know a lot about this. You know, when I was on a review panel, I would say 10 years ago, we would just, we were given the things to say, is there an evaluation section there? It was sort of a yes or no. But today, Lori, it's really different. There, we're being, as reviewers, being asked to answer questions like, is the evaluation section integrated into the goals and objectives of the proposal? In other words, is it just not standing by itself, but is it part of it? And I think all the things you said today really talk towards integrating evaluation as opposed to having it just stand there by itself. So I think if if we as proposal developers or evaluators or PIs think about that integrating evaluation, I think it would make the most sense. I have a second question for you. A lot of people liked this idea of using to what extent, as you do your key evaluation questions, to what extent did this happen? Mm -hmm. Do you assign scores to that uh, when you write up that? How do you how do you judge to what extent? Do you use a, a numeric value? Right. So I tend not to. I don't like to be answering evaluation questions with numeric values. But what I have done, um, it's more complex than I can go into right now. But basically, operationalize the different levels of extent. So let's say a possible answer to a question like that is to a great extent. Well, what's our threshold for something being a great right. extent? You know, what's what's excellent? So you have to operationalize that for your project with regard to history, with regard to your project's context, with regard to what you can reasonably achieve. But I really do like phrasing evaluation questions to allow for a continuum of answers, not just a yes or no. And I see this all the time. I, you know, it's not like it's a fatal flaw or anything because lots of people do it. You could say, you know, did the project have an impact on student achievement? Well, you're presenting, putting yourself in a position to say yes or no, and you know, you're not. Uh, so you're gonna have to define that line where what's a yes and what's a no, and it also doesn't get at the magnitude. Was it an important, you know, impact, a substantial impact? So I think of evaluation questions, I want to think of them as a light. I want to have a dimmer switch and not an on-off switch. But you're right about that. You do need to then go on to basically operationalize what's you know a small extent, what's a, a moderate extent, what's a, what's a large extent. Well, that makes sense. In other words, defining what, what uh, metrics you're going to use, what you mean by a, a big change. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question. It has to do with timelines. And by the way, folks, don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat window. We have one more um, 
question and answer session coming up. It has to do with timelines, this question, Lori. Uh, how, how elaborate should a timeline be? Do you put deliverables on it? Do you put milestones on a timeline? Or do you just give a rough, you know, every six months sort of view? And do, do you put evaluation stuff on the timeline? Lots of aspects to that question. Well what I think, Mike, and then I'll kick it back to you, but I think what you want to show reviewers in a timeline is you actually have a, a, a feasible plan. You've thought about how your project's going to unfold, what needs to happen when, what your milestones are. And I think actually, you know, I said put your evaluation timeline in the evaluation section or integrate with the project uh, overall timeline because you do need a timeline for your overall project. So I think you want it for you do want to see those like major evaluation activities or products represented in your project timeline at least to show that integration to show that you're getting information in a timely way that you could fold back into your project. But with regard to the specifics to include on a timeline, Mike, I, I'd like your thoughts on that. Well, I sort of echo your feeling here because a reviewer is looking uh, for reality. In other words have they overpromised, or have they actually thought about the sequence of events, what comes before what? Um, I think you're right there. They're, they're looking to make sure the timeline is reasonable. They're not going to argue about if this should go here or there, uh, but really it's that reasonableness that I would be looking for as a reviewer. So good comments there, Lori. Lori, we're perfectly on time. We're going to go into the final section and then pause again at the end for some more questions. Okay. Well, thanks for your good questions. This is the final section of the webinar, and it's going to be a lot shorter, and it's where we're going to deal with all the extra evaluation bits and pieces that go into a proposal. Like the references cited document, which is separate from your 15-page project description. So your references are not part of that 15-page maximum, but including up-to-date and relevant references to the evaluation literature in your project description can help show that the project is grounded in and really building on current knowledge and practice in evaluation. And if you're going to use a specific evaluation approach or instrument, provide citations to support its use in your context. So there isn't a page limit for the references cited document, but you should only include those references that you mentioned in your project description and that are relevant to your work. Of course, the budget and the budget justification are very important pieces of your proposal, and you definitely need to show that you're putting adequate resources into evaluation. You may recall this quote from earlier in the webinar about the requirement for an independent evaluator, about funding an independent evaluator, and the rest of the quote is that the requested funds much, must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. That isn't terribly specific guidance, so I just want to consider this a little uh, more closely. The rule of thumb in, uh, among evaluators is that you allocate about 10% of a project's direct cost to evaluation, and that's for any kind of evaluation. So I think that's a good place to start. And then you can go up or down from there depending on what level of evaluation is needed for your project and the type of uh, activities that are going to take place. Now, the reality in the ATE program is that the average is 7% uh, that ATE grantees spend on evaluation. But that's an average, so obviously some are going to spend a lot more and some are going to spend less. And that includes the real small grants as well as the multi-million dollar projects. So there's no magic formula, no magic number. The key thing is for the budget to match the scope of the evaluation effort. So if you have a small scale evaluation, you have a small budget. If evaluation is a huge part of your project, obviously it needs, it needs more resources. So let's just work through some basic math here for using when we use that 10% figure, figure for evaluation. So we're, here we have that project budget. So the total direct cost for the, implementing the project add up to $389,200, so the basic categories of cost. We use that to figure the evaluation, estimate the evaluation cost at 10% would be $38,920. And that's going to bring our direct cost to just over $428,000. Then you add in the indirect cost rate for the project's host college, which is 30% in this example. It could be a lot higher or a lot lower at your institution. And that's going to bring the project total to just 500, I mean, not just, but 556,556. Now, when we think about that uh, budget line for evaluation, let's 
highlight that, that 38,000, almost 39,000, what goes into that? Well, you'll specify that in your budget justification. You'll identify uh, the evaluator's daily rate, how much time they're going to commit to the project, and the major deliverables. It's really important that you show uh, you don't just give a lump sum for the evaluation. You need to show the specific individual pay rate. So the, there's more than one evaluator, and you need to give their different rates. I actually had to redo my budget justification uh, on a recent proposal because I hadn't specified the, the daily rate for my evaluator. So make sure that you do that. You really have to break out the cost of the evaluation. And finally, you have your supplementary documents. As I mentioned, the ATE program only allows specific documents to be uploaded here. One of these, and it's required, is a list of individuals who will be compensated by the grant. So this will include the evaluator. And you need a commitment letter from your evaluator that demonstrates that person's individual and organizational commitment to work on the project. They, NSF doesn't want to see a lot of fluff here. They just want to see that the person you know, understands what they're being asked to do and, what, and for what amount and during what time frame. And you need a biosketch for your evaluator. To help with that, uh, we've created a template for biosketch, evaluator biosketches. It involves NSF. Sorry, it follows the NSF format, and it has guidance about the kinds of information an evaluator would want to include, because it's a little bit different than a typical PI biosketch. Now, the reason it's in here, listed here among the supplementary documents, is because the biosketches for senior personnel, uh, I should say the bios that you upload in the biosketch section are for senior personnel only. So that would be the PI and the co-PI. You, you won't actually be able to submit the evaluator's biosketch there. So upload it as a supplementary document. Finally, all projects must include a data management plan, and that also is uploaded as a supplementary document. So the data collected as part of the evaluation should, address, should be addressed in this plan. And not just the evaluation data, it's really any products or data generated by the project should be addressed in the data management plan. Now, our good friends at ATE Central have great information on this, and we have links to their resources as well as others in our ATE evaluation planning checklist. But just briefly, here's the list, and this is straight from NSF, of the required elements of a data management plan. You basically need to explain what types of data will be um, or other project products will be generated, and how you're going to manage, share, and preserve those into the future. So with that, we've covered all the proposal pieces where evaluation related to your evaluation needs to show up. And we're going to have our last Q&A session in just a second. I just want to sum up by uh, reminding you that you really do need to read that ATE program solicitation. You should find an evaluator to work with uh, sooner rather than later if allowed by your institution. And be sure to check out the resources we created to help you with your evaluation plan. And feel free to email me with questions as well. I'm happy to answer. I'll do my best to answer them. So Mike, we have some time for our last set of questions. We do, and it has to deal the first one with almost your last remark there. And it, you mentioned uh, the inclusion of the evaluator. Should it be allowed? And here's the question, of course. What about procurement issues at community colleges and other places where um, an evaluation cost may undergo a bid process, and yet you have to include the evaluator in the proposal itself? You know that, that thing that we always deal with, yep. Lori. So what's your strategy? What do you think the best strategy is? Well, the good news on that front is that the ATE program now recognizes that this is an issue, and there is a paragraph in the solicitation about what you should do if you're not able to name your evaluator. So basically, it, the solicitation recommends that you identify the policy. You know, to, you're not just you know kind of glossing over that you're not going to identify your evaluator. You're explaining why. You know, that your institution has a policy um, against doing that, and then talk about how you're going to select an evaluator and what criteria you'll use to select them um, once the award was made. Now, in our the guide that I mentioned, um, the selecting and finding an evaluator for ATE proposals that I 
created and, and Mike, you helped with and others have reviewed, um, uh, there are links to resources to what we're calling it DIY evaluation. So if you really you have access to no one with evaluation, special evaluation expertise, what do you do? And we have guidance on how to work through developing an evaluation plan. Um, you can look at the, at the webinar that I mentioned on small scale evaluation. So I do think a project can go pretty far in developing a, a decent evaluation plan on their own. But do say why you're not allowed to select an evaluator in advance and how you're going to go about selecting. And pro providing an assurance that this can happen relatively quickly after the award is made. Well, that's a good point. You know, of course, from the evaluator side, if they're going to make the contribution to the proposal development, they're hoping to be named the evaluator. But I guess it's just something that has to be worked through these procurement issues, um, uh, just the way it is. Right. Another question that came up at the beginning of this last session is, as you look at some of those key evaluation questions, they seem to border on that line between research questions and evaluation questions. And in fact, in some proposals, not ATE, but say iTest or something like that, there is a research component. Do you have any sound mm -hmm. or guidance for how one distinguishes or thinks about the distinction between research and evaluative type of questions? Yeah, and this is one of those areas that we could debate all day. And I mean, the thing is that the, it's more of a continuum than a, than a black or white. Like, there aren't just buckets of, oh, that's research and that's evaluation. It's more of a continuum. And some answers to research questions, some research questions can be evaluative, and we can use them in that way. Um, not all evaluation questions are going to be, you know, substantial and robust research questions. I mean, the, the guiding, for me, a, a basic principle will, should be, um, if I phrase, I, I craft an evaluation question, my answer to that question, it should be, you know, it should be fairly clear whether that's a good good outcome or a bad outcome, not outcome, but a, a favorable, the pro a favorable review or a favor, reflects favorably on the project or not. So it should basically call for a, a claim of quality or value um, in the embedded in the question. So if we say, you know, to what extent did the student, did the pr program have an impact on, um, I don't know, retention? We know that a high impact on retention is good and a low impact would not be good, right? right? It's not mysterious right. there. So I'm a little bit babbling there, sorry, but I, I would Send people to the again that small scale evaluation webinar where we really break down uh, developing evaluation questions and align those questions to the project logic model to ensure there's good coverage on processes and outcomes. And answers to the evaluation questions should leave people with a clear understanding of how well the project was implemented and and the quality of the outcome. Oh, well, good. That's a good uh, thoughtful response. Thanks. Uh, one detail, you just mentioned logic model, and that question has come up again. Do you find yourself putting logic models in the evaluation section, in the project management section, uh, up front in the design? Where where do you think is a good place for a logic model? Well, a lot of people make the erroneous assumption that logic models are evaluation logic models. That's not true. Logic models show depict a project, and then we can use them to plan our evaluation. So I think they, if you're going to have one, it shouldn't be embedded in the evaluation section because it really does help people see the overall structure and, and logic of a project. So for me, if it's going to be in the project description, I would put it right up there when I'm talking about my goals, objectives, and activities, and deliverables. That's me. No, no but you're right. That. No, that's a good idea, good idea. Here's the last question, and our, our, we're just about at the top of the hour, so we're perfect. The question is, if someone called you and said, Lori, uh, I'm trying for that ATE submission date on October 5th, and I don't have an evaluator yet. Is it too late? What would you say? On, on what day? I'm calling going? you today after the webinar, and uh, the, the proposal oh, deadline is October 5th. Is it too late to find an evaluator? Gosh, no. Absolutely not. My, my guidance is to try to get start working with an evaluator at least a okay. month in advance. Um, it certainly happens with less time, and some evaluators are more accommodating than others. I know at an institution, it's hard for us to get anything approved and through to be um, to be tacked on as an evaluator in a grant. It's hard to get that through in yeah. less than a week. 
And you can't, it's not going to have the same quality and detail. So you do want to allow ample time, but it's definitely not too late at this point. Not too early either, though. Well, that's a perfect way to wrap up for today. Let me, let me take us to our final slide. Lori, as we finish up today, what I'm going to do is launch our survey, and that helps us turn on the lights, turn on the water, pay the bills. I'm joking. Uh, it does allow us to provide feedback to our sponsor, the National Science Foundation, uh, about the value of these webinars and suggestions for other things. So, Lori, that officially ends. I'm going to go ahead and launch the survey today. Thank you for all that insight uh, that, that you provided today. Here we go, folks. This is going to open in another browser window on your screen. The webinar is still going, but you'll see another w a window opening. This conference appears to Sorry, be again, inactive Lori. <laughs> and will be ended soon. If you are the host and wish this conference to continue, please press any key on your telephone. I'm going to have a word with that guy, Lori. But... So uh, so thank you again for all the insight. I think what really struck me today as I was looking at your page with all the resources today, how much detail is there? And I often turn to that myself to help guide evaluation development. So thank you for that. Thank you. And we really do have a lot of rich resources. And I hope you guys will use them. And please do that survey if you haven't already started. Thank Thanks you again, so Laurie. Remember, time. everyone, you'll get automatically by email a link to today's recording and to the slides as well. Thanks for joining. That officially ends our webinar.